Good morning, everyone. How y'all doing today? Awesome. Let's open with prayer. Lord God, thank you for bringing us together today to hear the message that you've given me. May I present it in a way that you would find glorifying to you and for our eternal benefit. In Jesus' name, amen. Do not let your hearts be troubled. What do you think about that? <laughs> Don't let your hearts be troubled. Well, let's look and look at what troubled means, according to my one commentary author. He took me back to Isaiah 57, verse 20 and 21. This is how he described trouble. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and muck. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Mire and muck. That's what he describes troubled as. So what's troubling you today? What's causing all that mire and muck to be splashing up into your life? Or what has troubled you so many years that every time it comes up, it just troubles you? What's buried deep down that really just stirs up that mire and muck? Does watching the local news or national news trouble you? Do you find yourself boiling inside? Troubling that mire and muck being stirred up? Does the daily reporting of COVID-19 and all the related topics trouble you? Masks, no masks, school in person, school at virtual, no sports, sports. No homecoming, homecoming, prom, no prom, camp, LLDC camp, or those stupid Christian radicals. They trouble you? I hope not. Let's see what Jesus is talking about when he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Because that's what the devil wants us. He wants us to be troubled. He wants us to be having all that stuff stirring up inside of us. He wants us to be fighting with our neighbors and our friends. He wants us to be thinking about all that other stuff so that we don't think about Jesus. Hey, Lucille, how are you doing? <laughs> Three and a half years before Jesus spoke these words in John chapter 14, he started his earthly ministry. I don't know about you, but I've been to quite a few installations of pastors, ordinations of pastors, and many baptisms. But Jesus' baptism and his ordination into the public ministry was beyond anything we could ever imagine. He was on the banks of the Jordan River, and John was baptizing him, and as soon as the baptism was done, the Holy Spirit descended from heaven in the form of a dove and lighted on his head, or on his shoulder, wherever. And God the Father spoke these words. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Could you imagine hearing those words? Could you imagine seeing the spirit come down in an earthly form? Now some authors say that only Jesus heard these words. Other authors say that the believers or the the true Jewish believers that were looking for the promised Messiah heard these words, and the ones that were trying to prove it wrong only heard thunder. I like to think of that one. The believers heard God say the words, and the unbelievers only heard thunder. They only heard the noise. Right after Jesus' baptism, what happened? In Mark, it says, immediately, the Spirit led him out into the wilderness. 
or the desert, depending on what your translation says, to be tempted for 40 days by the devil. By himself, 40 days with temptation. And what did Jesus do? He, de he defeated the devil out there. He did not succumb to the temptations that we would get. We have the same temptations, but Jesus withstood them. And how did he withstand those temptations? He used scripture. He used God's holy word to fight the devil. It's a great reminder for us to be in the word daily. So when the temptations come, we have that, we have that scripture thing in James that tells us to resist, resist the devil and he will flee from us. How easy, that's how easy it is if we just apply scripture to our temptations. And as soon as that last temptation was done and Jesus chased the devil away, then the angels attended to him and brought him food. After the 40 days was done, he started calling his disciples went along the Sea of Galilee and picked up Andrew and Simon and James and John and saw Nathaniel, what, saw Nathaniel under the tree. He called his disciples, common men like you and me, not well educated, but he knew he could teach them. He knew what their heart was going to be. Shortly after he calls his disciples, he goes to a wedding of a friend in, in Cana. Brings his disciples along. His mom's there. They run out of wine. What does mom do? <laughs> mom goes to uh, Jesus and says, hey, they're out of wine. And he looks at her and says, uh, what has that to do with me? My hour has not yet come. She probably gave him the look, if you think. <laughs> Turned around and told the servants, do anything he tells you to do. Well, Jesus was a good boy. Obeyed his mom. Made the wine out of water. Changed the water into wine. And it was the best wine served ever. But you notice here, Jesus did not perform that miracle in front of all the leaders or the banquet manager or any of the important guests. Where did he perform the miracle in front of? The servants. The common folk like you and me. He wasn't put on social media. They didn't have the newscasters there asking exactly how it happened. What did you think about that? He just does it quietly in front of the servants. Shortly after the wedding, they head up to the temple for the feast. Now, this is the first feast, you know, that we're that we talk about that they mention in the in scriptures. But when Jesus gets there, I think he's very troubled. I think he's distraught. I think he's got some stuff boiling up inside. Because he sees the money changers. He sees the people selling, buying and selling the animals for the sacrifices. In the temple courts. Not outside the temple courts. Right inside where the worship is supposed to be going on. And he clears them out. Because the money changers are shortchanging or making money doing that. And the uh, buyers and the sellers were making money because they were charging exorbitant fees for a required sacrifice. I'm pretty sure Jesus was troubled by that. And then a, then a Pharisee called Nicodemus comes to see Jesus in the middle of the night. Why? Well, he's pretty afraid of his uh, fellow Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, rabbis, leaders. 
that might not allow him to come back if he's caught with this man. And the great thing about this is that in his discussion with Nicodemus, Jesus gives us this great verse that we probably quote many times in our lives. Pastor uses it for every one of his funeral services. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Folks, we have eternal life today by believing. How easy is that? Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Not too long after that, Jesus is traveling again. Instead of going around the country of Samaria, he tells his disciples, we're walking through the country of Samaria. And about the third day in, they come to the well. Ah, they're pretty thirsty, they're pretty hungry. So the disciples go into town to buy some food, and Jesus stops at the well. And who's there? A Samaritan woman. And he asks her for a drink of water. And she's going like, are you kidding me? I'm a woman, you're a man, and again, now you're a Jewish man, and you're asking me for a drink of water? That's not even right. How can you do that? And then Jesus tells her that she should go into the town and get her husband and bring him back so he can talk to her and him. What does she say? Oh, I don't have a husband. He says, oh, you're right about that. You've had five. And the one you're living with now is not your husband. That blows her away. And so they discuss some more about where they can worship. And where. And she goes, we have our temple here in the mountain. We can worship, we worship the, our God up there. It's the same God. It's just that the Samaritan people got mixed in with some of those Babylonian people in one of the captivities. And so they're a mixed breed. And the pure Jewish blood wants nothing to do with them. And she says, we believe the Messiah will come, and then he will tell us all things. Yes, and this is one of my favorite verses. He looks at her and says, I who speak to you am he. He reveals himself to a Samaritan woman. What does she do? Does she keep it to herself? Nope. She runs into town and tells all the townspeople, you have to come and hear this man. He's told me everything I've ever done. And he stayed two more days and converted the whole village in Samaria to believers. How often do you run from church and tell everybody you know? about Jesus. I don't run to everybody. I, I wish I could. I wish I would. I work towards it. But it's an example by a Samaritan woman, considered a half-breed, considered not part of the chosen. Shortly after he speaks with the Samaritan woman, he's going to Jerusalem, and he's going by the pool of Bethesda, And there he sees a, a lame man that was injured sometime during his life. And he's been coming there for many, many years. And Jesus walks up to him, and this is one of my, another favorite verse of mine. In John 5, verse 6, he says to him, do you want to get well? Or do you want to be healed? Some versions say. Can you imagine that? Do you want to be healed? And the man says, um, yeah, 
but I don't have anybody here to get me into the pool when the angel stirs the waters. What does Jesus say? Pick up your mat and walk. Pick up your mat and walk. And he does. And then what does Jesus say? He says, go and sin no more. So we're led to believe that his sinfulness may have caused the injury that caused the lameness. Go and sin no more. I still love the verse, do you want to get well? We all probably do, physically, spiritually. Pray for healing. Many more miracles follow. So you've got to put yourself in the disciples' sandals, right? You're seeing all this stuff, and you're probably just getting blown away. We're only a few months into his ministry. Then we feed the 5,000. So people are, are hearing about these miracles because, you know, they're like you and me. Something like that, you spread that word, right? You know, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? You see what he's doing over here? Well, you've got to come see him. You've got to come hear him. And so 5,000 men followed him. And so he was down here and he was preaching up into the hillside there. And it got to be time to eat and people had been coming from a long ways away. They didn't have any food. So what does Jesus say to his disciples? Okay, let's what are we going to do for these people? How are we going to feed them? They're always going like, oh, we don't know. Uh, send them away. Where do you send 5,000 people? <laughs> Can you imagine 5,000 people on top of our community here descending into town and we say, now go buy some food. <laughs> All that we have modern would not handle that. So they find a little boy with five, fish, or five loaves of bread and two fish. And the bread that they talk about were the poor men's breads or loaves of bread. They're about this big around, about that thick. So what did Jesus do? He blessed them and started passing them out. Now they set them to groups of 50 on the hillside. And when you think about adding the women, or the women and children to it, they figure it's about 15 to 20,000 people that he's feeding with five cakes of bread and two dried fish. How long did it take to distribute that much food to those people? What a blessing. And the disciples are seeing this, right? They're watching these miracles. And so they get done with that, and immediately Jesus sends his 12 disciples across the lake in a boat. He's going to send them back to Capernaum. But he's going to go and sit, on, sit by himself a little bit up in the mountains just to collect himself, maybe get his thoughts together, rest a little bit. Because I know how exhausting it is just to do two services as the message. Can you imagine days and days of teaching? And Jesus was fully human, just like you and me. He was tired. And then a storm came up. So Jesus thinks he should probably go out and join his disciples. And how does he get there? He walks on water. And the disciples see him walking out on water, and it's like they think they're seeing a ghost. And he gets in, he, gets, he says, why are you worried about it? And he calms the wind, and he calms the storm, and immediately... They're on the shore. Are you walking in the disciples' sandals yet? Are you being blown away? I mean, we read about it here, but can you imagine living it? They didn't have all the stuff that we have where we can imagine it because people are throwing it on a screen, all these technical things, you know, the high tech, the, what things might look like, spaceships monsters, all these different things. They don't have that. All they have is what they can see. And then Jesus raises the dead, his friend Lazarus. The disciples see that. He's been dead four days in the grave. And when Jesus says to Mary and Martha that, you know, about, you know, he'll, don't, don't cry, he's going to be resurrected. He'll be raised. And she goes, we know on the last day. He says, no, now. 
She's going to take care of it now. Can you imagine seeing your best friend raised from the dead? Dead four days in the grave? And just keep thinking how I would be as a disciple. How would I be as a common person trying to understand all this? And now we're three and a half years later, and it's Palm Sunday. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, where the people were praising him, Son of God's coming. They're laying down the palm branches because that's how a victorious king enters a city. I can't imagine, I just, hearing the songs. The Jewish people were a singing group of people, that's for sure. And now we're on Thursday, Passover. And we're in the upper room. That's where these words are from. These words were written right before they left for the Mount, for, um, Mount of Olives. It's after the these words are spoken after the Lord's Supper was instituted, after Judas betrays him or leaves to betray him. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Now, did Jesus feel trouble? Did he ever speak that way? Well, there's three instances that I can show you here today. John 11:33 says, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, now this is at Lazarus' grave, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. Human emotions. He feels everything that we feel. Because he had to leave a, lead a perfect example. He had to lead a perfect life. He had to experience everything that we've experienced and more. Otherwise, he would not be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. In 12, verse 27, well, 26 and 27. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. We're about 20 hours from Jesus being hung on the cross and taken off already. Before the, the curtain, that three-inch thick woven curtain is ripped from top to bottom in the most holy of holies, to separate man from God. We're only a few short hours away. Can you imagine what that must be like as a human? You've accepted responsibility. You've accepted the call to be the sacrifice for you and me and all the people before us and all the people after us. In, in chapter 13, verse 21. After he has said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified to his disciples. I tell you the truth. One of you is going to betray me. Ever been betrayed by a best friend? A really close friend? Someone that you've been traveling with for three and a half years. Spent most of your days with. Many of your nights. Teaching them. Being very intimate with them. I'm sure there's so much more that was ever said than ever was written by Jesus. And to know someone's going to sell you out for 30 pieces of silver. But Jesus knew it had to be done. But he was troubled. 
As a human being, he was troubled. Jesus knows everything about us. He knows everything about our human existence. Can you imagine everywhere you went to worship and pray that the leaders of that church or the pastor of that church hated you, didn't want you in the building, get out of here? That's what the Pharisees were like. That's what the rabbis were like to Jesus. Plotting to kill him. How many times did the Pharisees pick up stones to stone him to death? And Jesus slipped away or became invisible because it wasn't his hour. His time had not yet come. And sometimes we worry about getting our feelings hurt. Now the disciples were being told by Jesus that their best friend, teacher, rabbi, is leaving them. And they can't go along. They're pretty confused. He's been pulling them along for three and a half years. Everywhere he goes, they go. This they believe. Jesus, who they believe is their Messiah, the Son of God, but they they haven't accepted him as more than an earthly king. They have to be aware of what's going on that week in Jerusalem, right? They're out there. They're hearing the undertones. They're hearing the talk. They're probably wondering, what's going on? Why is Jesus talking this way to us tonight? Why is he leaving us? Where is he going? Three and a half years of being taught by Jesus, seeing all the miracles, all the healings, the dead being raised, and then these past few hours, Jesus is telling them that he's going to be leaving them, that, he, that the man, Son of Man has to be lifted up high. They're confused. They, were just done, they just got done eating together. Jesus says he's going away. He's going to leave them. Just like us. How troubled they were. Think about it. When you get that phone call or someone knocks on your door and it's not, and it's late at night or you get a personal visit from someone, an email or a text and the bottom of your world drops out from underneath you. You know what that feels like, right? Laying on the floor, devastation. I've been there. And Jesus is saying to you, do not let your hearts be troubled. You never hear him say, I like this verse, because you never hear Jesus say, oh, yeah, worry about it. Oh, you better be afraid of that. What does he say? Fear not. Do not worry. Do not let your hearts be troubled. He says, I'm here for you. I will sustain you. I will get you through these earthly struggles. He will see us through them, through our faith in him. Here are the promises he gave to the disciples. Verses 1 through 7. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas, doubting Thomas, says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Wow. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no way to the Father except through Jesus. There is nothing else you have to do. He's gone before us into heaven to prepare a place for us. He's preparing it. Not some carpenter off the street that we might hire. Jesus is preparing that perfect place for us to be. And I'd be happy with a cardboard box. But can you imagine what heaven's going to be like? And Jesus is there preparing, and he's going to come back and take us to him personally. We don't need anything else. We only need Jesus. Faith alone and a life dedicated to him. <laughs> we'll end with verse 27. Ah, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Peace. Divine peace. Deep within us. Everlasting. Beyond all human understanding. Do you have it? Do you want it? Surrender yourself to Jesus and accept him as your personal savior. And he will give you his peace. Do not let your hearts be troubled, my friend. Let's pray. Oh, dear Lord, thank you for bringing us here today. For these words of promise that you give us. You are the way, the truth, and the life. We can come to the Father through you. You are preparing our home in heaven personally and promise to come back and take us to be with you when you return. And we thank you, Lord, for all of this. Help us to spread this good news to all people. In Jesus' name, amen.